This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. You know, when you think of Gene Ward, you think of somebody, you know, worldly, who has a tremendous education and understanding of the world as it exists today, well-traveled, um, and, you know, a kind person with a philosophical approach to the world. I'm sure that's an over oversimplification, but here he is in front of us, <laughs> and he can disagree with me. <laughs> this is Making Leadership Work with Representative Gene Ward. Hi, Gene. Well, Jay, I've never, I have been introduced in many ways, in many kind of uh, ups and downs, but that's the first time I've ever had an introduction like that. In my business, we're supposed to have over promise and under promise and over deliver. You promise, like, I will never fulfill. Whoever's watching this, whatever you just said about my worldliness and other things, uh, I will uh, probably disappoint people. But I did just come back from Israel, so I've got 64 countries under my belt. Wow. wow. So 63, 64. I can, at least as a traveler, account for those. But it's so, about, what are your takeaway points from Israel now that you're back? You know, having been a Peace Corps and a, a UN worker, I found that until you go overseas, you don't really know what being an American is about. Yeah. But when you go overseas, you find out, oh, yeah, that's who I, yeah, I believe this, and okay, I know how I am. But if you're Jewish or Christian and you haven't been to Israel, you don't know the fullness of the character by which you stand behind it. At the least cradle of civilization, as they say. Oh, historically, so significant, such diversity of, of people, food, religion, terrain. The Bedouins are still out there. It reminded me of the homeless people down in Kaka'ako. Uh, the, the desert area to the beautiful sides of the sh shores of Galilee. Phenomenal place with a great history, with a great people, and with great science and security that uh, is yeah. really a, a, a boon to the world, quite frankly. So it was very impressive, Jack. Very, yeah. very Complex impressive. society, diverse society, for sure. Oh, yeah. We, you're going to get many opinions <laughs> when it comes to a discussion. A true issue. democracy, tumultuous. Exactly. <laughs> and you have to be able to be verbally able to joust uh, very well because they're yeah. very adept at uh, yeah. that, that yeah. argumentation. But it, it was a great pleasure. My wife has wanted to go for 30 years. So finally, when it's an awful election year, we uh, took a two-week uh, two trip and we're blessed by it. Yeah. My wife and I went in 1978. It was a very exciting time. Well, you had some of the uh, the remnants of the war. Well, that was 67, probably. Was, uh, yeah. Some of the things that there were uh, security-wise different. There was we had uh, no security difficulties at all. Did you? There, have there was the, well. We we went right mm -hmm. after uh, a, um, a terrorist attack on the highway to uh, Haifa, mm -hmm. and uh, we decided as well. Terrorist attacks don't happen. In, it's not like waves, you know, in the, in the ocean when you go surfing. They just happen, and then later on they happen again, but not mm -hmm. immediately. So we figured it was safe, and it was. Uh, the terrorist I attack they, came and went, and nothing else And happened. I think the media kind of blows up when small things happen. They say, oh, this is another sign of the insecurity or the, 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 the danger of traveling to Israel. Generally, we saw nothing since, nothing, and well, we went into the Golan Heights. We had places where the bus driver was not allowed because he was Israeli and we were in the Arab section. But other than that, it was, it was, it was really nice. The weather was terrific. And uh, a lot of takeaway. Let, let me say something from the Christian perspective. I felt cheated when we went to where they said Jesus was born. Jesus was born in a cave. I was never told that. Huh? I thought it was a manger. No, no, it's not a manger. It was down underneath. I mean, if you want to talk about God who picks somebody of humble circumstance, being in a cave where the animals were also the small animals, I thought, wow, why, did, why don't we know that? Why don't people get taught that? Now, well, maybe that's why you got to go to Israel to find out. Yeah. But it is a kick, though, being around the places mm, you've read about in the Bible. Stuff. Yeah. Just to, the same hey, places. Did you go to the, Red, uh, the, the, uh, the Dead Sea? Did yes, you float? I did. I floated. I but, found uh, the buoyancy so phenomenal. When my feet were out floating away, I wanted to stand up and, you know, walk. <laughs> I couldn't get my feet to go down. The buoyancy was I had to, the center of gravity. I had to lurch forward. It's a weird down. experience. Isn't it? I, mean, it's, I mean, that experience is unique in itself. And you went to Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum there oh. near, near the Negev or in the Negev. Three times the size of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. 
my wife, who is a very sensitive, nonviolent sort of person, she said, I, I, she couldn't go it's in. It's hard it to be there. too gut-wrenching, sad, historically. And, and Jay, as I said earlier, how can man's inhumanity to man revert to such barbarism, which I know when we get into leadership later on in this interview, there's a lot of that stuff still going on today, but there's really a record of it, it really well done, very well told. So anybody who goes to Israel has got to go to that Holocaust Museum. Well, when you say never again, you've got to say what it is you don't want to have ever again. And uh, those, those museums, uh, both in Washington and in Israel, mm. are important to, to make that statement. But the, but the reality is, in many ways, it has happened again. Yes. It is happening again. It is. ISIS, for example, you know. I cannot imagine in this 21st century how one nation or one people or whatever group they call themselves can say that this group doesn't have a right to exist. I mean, a right to exist is not up to man. I mean, we never choose where we're born, who we're born, or what gender we're born. But to say that this group of people, the Jews don't have a right to exist, or Israel has no right to exist, I find that a phenomenal leap of humanity instead of going forward is really, really, really yeah, going yeah. backwards. I, ju I just don't understand. Yeah. And, and it's so inefficient. You can spend your, dime, your time doing constructive things instead of that. <laughs> but uh, I think it's when Israeli, uh, uh, Israeli, the Prime Minister of England, was asked by uh, Queen Victoria, is the Bible true, Prime, Mr. Prime Minister? Prime Minister turned and said, Madam, if it wasn't true, there would be no Jews left on the earth. Because of so many times to smother or to kill or die out or move them out, if God wasn't watching over them, including you, Jay, <laughs> you, the Jews wouldn't be here. So I think that was a, a good proof of it. But going back to the historical parts of it, anthropological parts, I think it's just uh, it's for an opportunity. Because I've been in so many countries, I never usually get taken by the travels. It's more the people that I meet, the language. I speak Malay, Indonesian, Vietnamese, and some yeah. Chinese. And I thought, something's going to be different about this, and it is very, very and different. And it was. So you got to go back. 78, you got to renew your area. <laughs> and long. they don't put your thing in the passport. They give you a little card that says, with your photo and all your particulars, so there's no stamp in the passport in case you're going to go to <laughs> Egypt. Go to an Arab country. Go to an Arab country. You're not going to be marked by it. <clears throat> I'm glad you went. I think that's it great. Was, yeah, it makes was me want to go back. Yeah. Thank you for asking about it. Yeah. Well, let's, let's uh, go to the topic of our show. Uh, that is, uh, the, the show is uh, Making Leadership Work. And I guess uh, what we were going to talk about today is uh, what does uh, leadership mean in, in North Korea? Uh, how does uh, Kim Jong-un sway the North Korean people? He's doing it for a long time. His father and his grandfather, they did it too. Um, and it's, it's a special kind of leadership. Not totally unique, though. We've seen this before. Mm. Probably see it again in the human condition. But what is it, I pose the question for our discussion, what is it that, that gives him this power over the people in North Korea? A couple of things. One is, just to generically define leadership, it's whatever he says it is. Whatever Kim Jong-un says leadership is, it is. And it's a cult of personality based upon probably the last 50 years from the grandfather, uh, Kim Il-sung, who through the Junchi or the self-reliance when... The South Korean and the North Koreans broke off and they went with the Soviets and the Soviets blessed Kim Il-sung and gave him a communist manifesto. They built around that a cult of personality, almost deification, if you will. And with that became a leadership of the, the sword or the bullet or the cannon to where if you try to cross the leadership, which is ordained uh, within this family uh, sacrofant uh, uh, cult, you are going to be in trouble. As you know, when the grandson first came to power, he killed his uncle straight away. Just a year ago, in my wife's uh, previous location in Kuala Lumpur, they killed the half-brother. So leadership by fear, leadership by total power over the lives of people, because he's got a lot of starving people. He's a GDP of $1,800 a year. He's got people who are probably depend upon his good nature to stay alive, number one, and number two, to be able to be fed and, and clothed. So as an example of leadership, it's probably the kind of leadership, Jay, we don't want to have, we don't want to have as a model, but it's where there's leadership by fear. And there's a lot of people who probably work in some places where they fear their bosses, 
it's a mild case compared to North Korea, but the way I've seen it from Hawaii's point of view, we have, we can't just say he's crazy, we can't say, like some people say, he's very rational, but we've got to take our proximity to North Korea very seriously, and it's going to be our leadership, trans or juxtaposed to his leadership, that we got to outsmart him rather uh -huh. than uh, fight uh, sabers and nuclear weapons with him. Ah, scary that this could exist in today's world, you know, with all the, you know, revolutions in, that we've had in the past, what, mm. four or five hundred years, if, if that, maybe less than that. Um, and with all the, you know, the, uh, what do you call it, social media and, and the, the communing of the crowd, where the crowd talks to each other, mm. where people have a kind of community uh, and they can speak about and to government. And they can ask government to represent them and do what, you know, something for the, the common good. Um, in this case, none of that exists. Not a thing. Uh, and you wonder how really he gets away with it. Uh, the people there must be terrified. They must be ignorant of what's happening mm -hmm. outside. You know, like, for example, the Internet in North Korea is only within North Korea. You can't get anything from outside of North Korea, you know, and you can't send anything. That is a key point, because some people, like myself, thought that the way that the Israelis and the U.S. destroyed the Iranian uh, missile program was through the computer. But I was just told by an admiral the other day, can't do it because their internet doesn't go to the rest of the world because they don't want the rest of the world to tell their people how bad they are given all the good stuff that's going on yeah. outside. Yeah. So they've disconnected it. But they've got hackers they had a battalion of hackers that go out to the internet, but you can't get to the internet into the people. Right. And so into special, their isn't it? So that, that's a key point. Yeah, and they're going to attack Sony to... and who knows oh, what else. Big yeah. time. They haven't hit your studios yet, have they? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> yeah. That would be interesting. <laughs> so, okay, so you got fear, you got ignorance. Um, I, guess, I guess that's it. But you also have a, a cultural tradition. I guess if it's gone three generations, mm. that's enough to call it a cultural tradition. Yeah. You, you know, if you look at generic Korean uh, culture, there is, and in the South, high respect for elders, high respect for authority, for politicians, uh, contrary to in the U.S., there's, if, if you're a leader, uh, you tell people and they generally will follow what you're saying. Now take that to the extreme in the North, and you get basically the Stalinistic, the Leninistic, you will do these kinds of things, or the, like the Ayatollah kind of, this is the way it is and there's no compromise. That is something that is really the, the dictates of the kings of the past, which we've kind of got away from, but for those strong arm uh, regimes like uh, Kim Jong-un, they still exist and have persisted because the people haven't been able to see any other models in their isolation. They call it the hermit kingdom because <laughs> yeah. they're so isolated, they don't know any better. Yeah. And it's gonna take a while to open them up. You know, it was tried earlier with the Clinton. Look, we're gonna give you food. There's some problems. I know you've got some starvation going. They didn't say starvation, but, and there was gonna be food for uh, opening up of the North Koreans, and for a while it, w it was going on, but then they pulled back and the thing fell out. Under Clinton, also it was a regime that was on the terrorist list. When President Obama came in, they pulled it off the terrorist list, and as you and I were reminded today or yesterday, today, today, the Trump administration, the White House today, 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 it went back on as a nation of, uh, on the list of terrorist nations, which, I think it deserves to be on because it's, it's threatening not only Hawaii, Guam, and the Pacific, Jay. They have got, as of July 4, the weaponry to reach as far as Alaska, the West Coast, and I'm not convinced that it can't probably even go to the Midwest and, and, and beyond. Yeah. So when they say, well, he may not have the technology to link the, the nuclear tip, when the July 4 thing came out and the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is the Pentagon's top intel people, said, oh, we underestimated by five years his technological capacity. That was embarrassing. That was unacceptable. Five years, you mean we got intel that says you can't tell somebody within five years what their capacity is? So when the people say, well, we need more weapons, more ships, I say, we need better intel. We got to put some money into intelligence. Isn't that true? That was just really, really bad. The point is, 
We're all in jeopardy because of uh, Kim Jong-un. All of us. Yeah, are in and I want to add to the factors we were talking about before, the weapons. I mean, if you, if you achieve and you storehouse and you show off weapons of this, of this magnitude, of this threat, that helps you stay in power. And finally, the last thing, and you mentioned it, I, I just, uh, it's, it's irresistible, is that there are people outside of North Korea who want to see him remain. Um, the Russians kind of set him up or set his family up years ago. Maybe the Russians want him to stay. If for no other reason uh, to destabilize the area, to destabilize the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the power of the U.S. there. Yeah, the U.S.-South Korea nexus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there are people outside actually rooting for him and want to see it this way. Yeah, when and, you, and I think it's a mixed bag about China. Well, when you put it with the, the Chinese variable, I think probably the most, the, the, the hand with the, the most amount of uh, power in it or the chips are in the, in the Chinese hands. And as I speak to the Koreans and some of the military people, you know, there's no love lost between the Chinese and the Koreans. They are not buddy-buddy. It's not a love affair at all. In fact, I was told the other day that it was like 10 or 15 historical incursions of the Chinese with pushing back the Koreans, but they never stay in occupied like the Japanese came and they made a colony out of uh, Korea. The Koreans would always sort of push back and never really overcome by anybody. So the sense of the North Korean survival, Kim Jong-un has always been to show that you're strong, you got to produce those weapons. You got to demonstrate on every holiday or birthday or whatever that you've got the weaponry because he thinks that's his key to survival. I was on Voice of America about three weeks ago and they said they were going to broadcast it into North Korea. Do I have anything to say to Kim Jong-un? I said, Kim Jong-un, you don't build a strong nation by building weapons. You build it by building your people. Build your people first, then you go to weapons. And right after this break, we're going to talk about what efforts have been made to do that and what efforts could be made in the future. That's Gene Ward, state representative, a, a man who, who is worldly, philosophical, contemplative, and he's here at Think Tank. <laughs> what else would you want in a Renaissance person? We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the Hispanic Hawaii host. Think Tech is important to me because it provides me the opportunity to express my freedom of speech and also empower me to exchange ideas and views within our community. For the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating an online web-based fundraise campaign to raise $40,000. Key thanks to ThinTech, we run only during the month of November, and you can help. Please donate what you can so that ThinTech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civil engagement through free program and live mine. I have already made my donation and look forward to yours. Please send in your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website, www.thanksforthinktechcowsbox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by Think Tech Hawaii's 30 plus weekly shows, thank you, gracias for your generosity. Okay, we're back with Gene Ward exploring leadership of course, on making leadership work here in Hawaii, um, and looking at Kim Jong Un and trying to what well, we see, what we can learn about it. Mm. So I guess you know, I guess I'm asking you to prognosticate what could happen. You know, people have tried. People have been. People here in Hawaii have been very sympathetic to the possibility that we could we could make we could civilize Kim Jong Un. We could talk to him nice, and he would somehow come around. We could make we could do business with him. We could improve the economy, the you know the dreadful economy of his of his country. Um, we could bring him into the you know the, the world of nations, the community mm. of nations. Uh, if he would if we would just play nice with him, that hasn't worked at all at any level. Uh, and and I suppose one could argue um, that the, the reason is that he needs to have a scapegoat outside. He needs to have a pariah that he can. He can make his people afraid of, uh, and, and then he, he needs to maintain that kind of tension so he maintains his power. But given that possibility, 
is there a chance to actually have relations with him? You know, as long as he keeps his people in fear and trembling, probably no change will happen. Probably his, his control over the people is going to be absolute. Uh, you know, when you mentioned that, you know, the, the, the way that he's treated as, as, I think I said, godlike, it's something where until someone gives an alternative for that, probably not much is going to happen. I know the uh, South Koreans have tried to take out some of the, the individuals, but then he would say, if I even smell a preemption, there's 15 to 20,000 cannons aimed at Seoul. And anything that's going to preempt, to mistakenly or, or on target, to say that we're going to cut you off, there's going to be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in Seoul. So the, the collateral Seoul damage is, 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 is very, very, very severe. The collateral damage is severe. The risk of... He sees his weaponry as his raison d'etre. He sees that the way, as a bully would see his strength or his size or his intimidation. Short of that, I don't think he's going to denuclearize because the null hypothesis of what you said, look at Gaddafi, look at Saddam Hussein. When they give up their weapons, what happened? They either got hung or shot in a hole. And he sees if he denuclearized, he's got no chance. Not that he's got a photo of uh, Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein. But those are the guys who gave up their nuclear uh, weapons. And, you know, that's the negotiable position of America. That if we're going to talk to you, if we're going to do the ho mali mali and all the other parts, you're going to have to forswear these uh, nuclear weapons. And that's probably the last thing that he would ever consider. Mm. But if you look at China and the influence they have, they don't want the Americans and the South Koreans on their border. They, they want a buffer state. The Russians, they, they like to stir stuff up and... Russia is still looking for its identity. They thought they were Europeans really? and they're Asian. Now, now we're Russians and we don't have all the stuff that we want. So they're kind of a confused sort of people. I think and so. Putin is sort of the confuser in chief as it goes. <laughs> but for Kim Jong Un, if I prognosticate, it's going to have to be where someone looks at the Korean Peninsula as either unified with the Korean people front and center, rather than this particular guy and his family. The transition to that is the difficult thing. I said earlier, it'd be nice to knock out his weaponry, then he's got nothing. But because of the way he's got that cult of personality and his defense and the way he's moving, even though, uh, Jay, I should mention that in the, uh, <clears throat> I just had a uh, Hawaii emergency uh, management a town hall meeting in Hawaii Kai, and General Miyagi said, you know, you got to take notice, it's been a full two weeks, now it's even been longer than that, that Kim Jong-un has not been seen or heard. Now, remember when we used to watch Castro or Khrushchev, oh, he hasn't been seen in public, he may be sick and all the other stuff. I don't know if, if that's the case. He may be bending to the severe pressure that China has put on, or as when we just declared today, he's a... Uh, exporter of terrorism, a terrorist uh, list nation, he's going to get much more ratcheting down of his, um, of his economy. Well, part of, I think part of this administration's uh, move, put him back on the terrorist list, is that if he's on the terrorist list, then our friends, we ask and expect our friends to isolate him further. Sanctions are mm. ratcheted, are increased. Mm -hmm. uh, not only by us, but by anyone we have influence over. And that would include, to some extent, China. Although China has, I think China has a sort of secret compassion for him and a secret need to make him a buffer state, of course, yeah, that's, uh, that's against the us. Um, but, I, but I think, um, you know, there's, the, the sanctions will increase now. They are increasing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know, and I think the term the White House uses is like extreme, most extreme sanctions. But query, question, will that work? with the kind of guy we have been defining in this discussion? Will that work? Will it work to threaten him? Um, or will he just become more dangerous? Let me show you now how naive I am. Uh, I wrote to uh, General Mattis, saying, General, you know, we've got the Hawaii, we're unprotected, we need a little bit of more protection. I wrote to Trump saying, you're the uh, diplomat in chief, 
Why don't you sit down with Kim Il-jung in Hawaii? We've got a diplomatic excellent organization at the East West Center. We've got this Asia Security uh, Study Center in Waikiki. Let's try diplomacy because when the diplomats stop talking, the bullets start flying. I'd like to see an all-out charm offensive as much as possible at the highest level as possible. And then when that doesn't work, if anything untoward does happen, people will know and understand, look, we tried everything that we could do. We sanctioned them, we talked with them, and the belligerence is still staying there. And Jay, what we've got to remember is Hawaii has got 12 to 15 minutes to adjust. 20 minutes to get there, but it takes them five minutes to figure out where the missile, if it's coming, is it going to go Kauai, is it going to go wherever? So you got 12 to 15 minutes to get to what otherwise is get inside, stay inside, stay tuned. And if that, if that unthinkable thing hits, you know, we're, we're in we're pretty done. bad shape. Well, it was, aside from the initial blast, what about the, all the fallout? Yeah, the fallout. And if it hits the ground, the fallout is worse because all the dust and all the debris yeah. circulates for yeah. hours and hours. But if it's, if it's up at the oh, top, I think it's the end of the it We'll all be radioactive. Well, you know, th this is something we had in our town hall meeting in, the, at the, uh, in Hawaii Kai with General Miyagi. And he said, well, you're probably talking about a four to six mile radius or six mile diameter. So if they were going for Pearl Harbor, you live in Tantalus or whatever, you're probably in... Up in the mountains. Up in the mountains. You're probably in Hawaii. We're far away, but depending on where the wind blows. The wind could blow sure. into your neighborhood or it's wherever. It's only a short distance. But they can't knock out Hawaii at one full stop. He's, the, the big bomb is not that big, even though it was 10 times Hiroshima, yeah. which was a big, big uh, blast. You wouldn't want so, to live here, though, Gene. Uh, yeah, for what, you know, they still got it going on in Kwajalein and Bikini and those places where exactly. they did the experiments. Yeah. But if he does an EMP, you know, the electromagnetic one, and just knocks out all the electricity. In fact, Jay, if you look at really the prognostication of what war is in the future, it's knock out their economy by knocking out their banking and their energy system and knocking out all the electrical power. And people, I mean, who knows how to even make a battery anymore from nothing. So that, to me, <laughs> is where the... The future of warfare is going to be. But this guy, he's a wild card. No one in the history of America has ever said, you, I mean, we're going to kill you, we're going to, all this, the crazy stuff that he said. Well, well but maybe that's a method, with a, a madness with a method. Maybe, yeah, uh, you he's know, he's known he's, for those things for, and, and, you know, and, he, and he can really years. achieve some notoriety mm -hmm. by being a little crazy or a lot crazy. question ultimately is, um, would he ever really attack? Would he ever really send a bomb? Because, you know, it's very clear from the administration's statements that, that they will, the administration will destroy North Korea in the process. They'll do a lot of damage to South Korea, by the way, collateral damage. Yeah, definitely. Because there'll be nuclear bombs and, 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 and the same radioactive cloud will be over South Korea mm -hmm. just the same way. It'll destroy that part of the world. Um, but, but will Kim Jong-un, is he so crazy? It's a big question. He's faking us out with this either reality or this pretense of craziness, and we can't figure it out. Do you, have you figured it out? Uh, you know, it used to be mad, mutually assured destruction, so we respected each other, right? I think with Kim Jong-un, it's, it's sad. It's suicidal assured destruction because for sure he's going to lose everything he's got. So he's got to play his game. The bully's got to go so far before he punches you to scare the crap out of you to make you do what he wants you to do. So far, has he made anybody do anything? He's got now a platform in the world of nations. He's got his elbows on the table of uh, the 200 or 190 nations in the UN. He's got everybody's attention. He's got the respect out of fear. He doesn't have respect out of adoration or of, of dignity. But he's accomplishing, nobody's going to invade me. One of the scenarios of uh, the missile crisis in Cuba may be of relevance here. How did we stop the Russians from putting in their missiles? What we negotiated, Jay, if you remember, and by the way, uh, John Kennedy's uh, uh, 54th year of assassination comes up on the 22nd, two so days ago. It's been that long already. 54 wow. years. The reason why probably I'm wired the way that you so eloquently flattered me when you did my introduction about the international part. <laughs> the imagination, the visionary part of a leader is one of the components that you, we, we haven't talked about or yeah. haven't mentioned yet. Yeah. But in terms of how we settled the Korean, the, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis was assuring the Russians and the Cubans, we will not invade your territory. Take away the missiles, we'll assure we don't guarantee. To me, that's kind of probably a win-win for North Korea. 
look, China, we're not going to invade North Korea. Look, Kim Il-jung, you go play your crap games and all this other stuff. Denuclearize, we promise we won't invade you. That, to me, is probably one of the best ways to negotiate something. And I think we would keep our word. We haven't invaded Cuba. There's been a lot of exiles that tried to go in. Aside. Was that right after before, or how was the context of that? It was a half-hearted effort, the way we did it. Like, I'm not really sure that we've... Yeah, it was half-hearted, it was, and it was by proxy, <clears throat> and it, it, didn't, it obviously didn't do what it was intended to do. But that may work. We say, okay, yeah. look, we, we will sure we'll never invade you, because that's yeah. why he's got all these weapons, is because, yeah. look, we don't want anybody to uh, penetrate our so existence. There's some, many things you've mentioned, um, you know, to talk about uh, that kind of leadership. It's a special kind of leadership. It's, a, it's, a, it's dictatorial leadership taken to a new level, actually, in our world today. Although he doesn't have the brutality of, of, the, uh, of Hitler in the Second World War. It's, there's some uh, rules. Although there is plenty of brutality yeah. going on. Yeah. Uh, it's not the same kind, I guess. He does, he does kill and imprison many people. Um, but I, and I wonder what it teaches us about the kind of leadership in, in relief, you know, in distinction that we want. Uh, that you know, we have we have tumultuous democracy. Often it doesn't work well. Sorry, mm. um, we have the Chinese brand of whatever that is. I don't know what you call that. Um, and that that seems to work well in building an economy. They've done mm. a pretty good job, um, and they've done uh, he hegemony really all over that area. That you know, for the lack of our continuing presence there. Um, so the question, I suppose, is what, what role does worldliness or worldview or international focus play mm. in American leadership today? And, and, and the ultimate question, Gene, I, this is putting a lot on you, I'm sorry, um, is what role does that play in Hawaii leadership? After all, mm. we're in the middle of the Pacific. Like it or not, you know, we're in, we're in a world, an international situation. We're between the U.S. and Asia, we're in an international situation. So what, what, is it important for us to focus on the same international issues? Well, Jay, that, that is, a, is a huge question, and, and to answer it, you gotta kind of deconstruct it, but let, let me begin at the macro level. Sort of the things that we don't want, we know is a one world order. I think it's one of the things that probably started with H.W. Uh, Walker Bush, and the one world order, I think we've seen that there's enough pushback on that, that, that that's not gonna be a model. If you've got a model like China where you're economically free, theoretically you become politically free, or in the Russian model you become economically, or politically free, and then you will become economically free. Um, Maggie Thatcher said it best, all roads lead to democracy. Either free your people economically, then they'll become politically free. Singapore hasn't done that yet, you can't, you can do anything economically. You get involved in politics, you're in trouble. The other side of it is if you give political freedom, democracy, then the economy will also free up. I think the nature of man, and this gets a bit more philosophical than perhaps uh, we should be talking about, but the nature of man is to be as much free, but also one of the driving things, and I noticed it in Israel, security is a big point. And security is something that you can't deny. So we got to have a system where people are free to speak out, but they feel secure and able in, in being enabled to do that. Right now, we've got it where there is many voices, particularly over, as you said, social media. There are so many voices in cacophony in democracy. I think it's going to take somebody, and I go back to my hero, John Kennedy, where you got a vision that people buy into, and by buying into the vision. People are willing to sacrifice. They're willing to yeah. give to their community rather than, hey, what can I get out of my community? Ask not what your country can give you, but what you can give to your country. That's you. really Thank the you, bottom Gene. line of what I'm looking for. Gene Ward, state representative extraordinaire. And Jay, the best interviewer this side of uh, Mike Wallace. <laughs>